Good evening. Thank you all for coming. My name is Natalie Basmajian. I'm your library services manager. We also have our programming assistant, Terry Sanchez, and our library assistant, Daisy Hernandez, with us, and our marketing specialist, Catherine Milkey. Um, we're very excited to have Floor Edwards here tonight. Um, I read the book after we had booked the program and found it to be such a clear storytelling um, style that she has. I really did feel like I was watching what her family was dealing with and how they were traveling. And I'm not going to give away everything right now, uh, but I'll give a brief overview. Um, Fleur lived in 24 locations on three continents by the age of 12. Um, she has 11 siblings. And she and her family were part of the Children of God organization, which was started in Huntington Beach, California. She's come full circle, and now they, she lives in Orange County, where her husband grew up. And I'm sorry? Oh, I thought you said never. My mistake. My mis oh, father, your father, your father. I read it in November. I missed a detail. Um, anyway. Growing up, they were not allowed to read or write or have a formal education. And when the leader of the organization, Father David, passed away in 1994, uh, the, everybody, the 12,000 people that were with the group, had to figure out how to live in a new way in the world, not having that exposure before. Uh, I just want to say thank you to our friends of the library for helping fund this program. Uh, they run our bookstore out in the lobby and also our quarterly book sales. So without further ado, Floor Edwards. Thank you. And no one's ever said I had a husband before. I was like, I, was like, I have a husband? Oh, I didn't know that. Oh, wow. Um, well, thank you so much all for coming. Um, I've done quite a few ev events over the year. The past year, my book came out um, last March, so we're about to hit our one-year anniversary. Um, but I actually, I don't think I've had this large of a crowd before, so this is very exciting. Um, and thanks to Terry and Natalie. Um, I've been in correspondence with them for, for about over the year, and I haven't, I just met them tonight. So when I came in um, about a year ago, I, I didn't think this would happen because I don't know if any of you have published a book. It's, it's very hard to book events. Um, you think, oh, it's easy. You have a book out. I'm an author. I can you know, go to a library and do an event. And, and it took almost a year just to, to come and do this. So thank you all for coming. Um, I'm going to do something a little different tonight. I've actually never had a visual presentation before. Um, I'm a firm believer in the power of the word, the power of language. I actually opted not to include photos, which of course everyone wanted photos in my book because as you hear, it is a very, um, it's a very powerful story. There is, I, I have photos and they are, they are very good, but I, I wanted the reader to be able to, to visualize, as Natalie was saying, to visualize the world, the world that I was creating, that I lived through just through words. However, tonight I did decide to, um, to give you all a visual aid, okay? So we'll see how this goes. Um, <clears throat> I'm gonna actually start because what I'm gonna read later, I talk a little bit about, and I talk about this a lot, um, the media's portrayal of cults. Um, so before we start, whenever I talk about my story, the, the most common response I get from people is, oh, I grew up in a cult, or or I, you know, I have a friend who is part of a cult. So does anyone have any type of experience, maybe through a second person, or maybe they had an experience where they were in a cult, or maybe suspicious of a cult? A few people, not as many as I thought. She's like, her over there, she, she, she is. <laughs> um, so yeah, it's a lot more common, I think, than, than people will realize, um, although some of them are as extreme. Um, so when I w went to grad school the first time, I'm in grad school again for the second time. Um, students would tell me that they'd grown up in a cult, and I was like, "Really? Which one?" And they're like, "Oh yeah, we lived in in Virginia, and we um, lived on a farm, and we ate tofu." 
And I was like, no, 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 no. You have no idea what a cult is. I mean, we're, I'm going to talk a little bit about what a cult is. Um, but yeah, most people have had some type of experience um, with a cult on some level. And there's, there's a lot of different characteristics that make a cult a cult. And this is all stuff I had to learn. Because when I grew up, I had no idea I was in a cult, obviously. I knew something was weird and different. But it took me a long time, um, starting when I was a teenager, to understand what I had been through. Okay, so um, I'm going to start by first defining what a cult is um, and then talk a little bit about the difference between a sect and a cult, which actually I just learned about. Um, my book was picked up by the Religious Studies Department at Cal State Fullerton, where I got my undergraduate degree, and they actually used it for their um, religious studies under undergraduate courses, which was very exciting. So I got to go speak there, and I heard a professor talk about the children of God, but in a much more academic way. So kind of like a, a researcher looking in, you know. So growing up, it was almost like, I always say now, we were like an anthropological study. Um, I mean, it was, it, was, it was rather extreme what we were doing. And um, it's definitely a subject of great fascination for, for academics. And so he talked about it. And um, I didn't really know this, but. Um, there is a difference between a cult and a sect. And the children of God was actually both, but the characteristics that made it a sect is actually quite interesting. Um, I want to talk a little bit about how cults control um, their followers. And I think whether or not you've had ex an experience with a cult, everyone has had, or most people have had an experience with a controlling person, a manipulative person, a narcissist you know, an abusive relationship. And it's basically the same thing. It's just that in a cult, you have that extreme authoritative figure. And you have people following him as if, or her, as if um, what they're doing is, is correct and just and, um, and allowed. So that's what we had. And then from there, I'm going to talk a little bit. But I also want you to be intrigued enough to buy the book. <laughs> um, OK, so first of all, um, these are just some things that I, I picked up. I, I recently took a class in linguistics, and I, um, I love this idea of features of a word. So every word we have um, has features that um, give it meaning. Um, so the, the, I just came up with these. These are some features of a cult. It's a group of people. You have to have people to have a cult. Um, I always say that without without the followers, the cult leader would just be a madman, right? But he speaks, and people listen, and they follow, and all of a sudden, he's this glorified cult leader. So that's what, what Father David was, who, who was the leader of this group. Um, they are, they're rebelling against the status quo. So cults, um, usually they see something in society that they they think is wrong, and, and they want to they wanna create change. Um, so the Children of God, I always say, actually had very humble beginnings when it started. It didn't start out as a cult. Um, no cults do. No one's, you know, like, we're going to start a cult today. Um, it just starts out as a group of people trying to do something different. Um, so they're rebelling against something. They're attempting an alternative lifestyle. So usually they're trying to, to not just rebel and ideologically, but to um, to adopt a completely different lifestyle, hence the tofu farm, right? <laughs> um, they're trying to create a new paradigm. So there's a lot of ideolo ideology that goes along with it. And ours was um, very biblical. It was based on the Bible. Um, <clears throat> they cut themselves off from society. So those are all the essential features. The last three are called non-essential features of, of a cult. And so they may or may not have um, a leader. So they'll follow the teachings of a leader. Um, they'll try to recruit members. Not all cults you know, have the evangelical um, component like ours did. But, but typically, they, they, they think they're doing something really good. So they're trying to gather as many followers. So when I grew up, um, that's all I knew was we were the world was ending. I don't know if I told you that, but it was apocalyptic. So um, from the time I was around five, I didn't know that I would live past 12. So I thought the world was going to end at 12, and you know, Armageddon would come, and 
the world would be swallowed in fire, and it was our job to save the world. So for most of my childhood, we were, we were out on the field trying to recruit people, um, save people, tell them about you know, our message, which was, was based on the Bible. Um, they, and they, they believe that they're working towards a common goal, and that's where they create the us versus them mentality. And that's where I think things get dangerous because it's no longer holistic, it's no longer part of a whole, it's saying we're superior to you. And that's kind of, that's where, that separation is always gonna create um, problems, I think, right? When someone says, I mean, we see it today even in politics, right? Like, uh, you know, this, this is better than that. So once they create that mentality, um, I mean, growing up we were told that we were the chosen. I know everyone's heard that, you know, all, all kinds of groups have that, you know, the 144,000 chosen. Um, so I'm sure people have heard that before, but we were the chosen. Just like, why? We were the chosen. Um, so those are just the features that I kind of gathered. I'm sure there's probably more. Um, okay. Now the difference between... Okay. Difference, I hope I don't offend anyone here. The difference between a sect and a cult is that a sect... They don't necessarily have all the characteristics of a cult, they might, but a sect is just a group of people that adopts ideology from a larger group. So Christianity, it's very vague. Christianity covers a wide gamut of you know, teachings. Um, so for example, in Islam, you have Sunnis and the Shias. In Christianity, for example, Catholicism. And like, I just learned the children of God. So again, that's, I think, something that's often overlooked. And I think as I went through this journey of writing this book, of sharing my story, I always try to get as much information as possible. And when the media reports my story, of course, they always want to focus on the sensational aspects of it. Um, but the truth is, we, we were a very Bible-based group. You know, growing up, I did not, like Natalie said, I wasn't allowed to read or write. Um, watch movies or talk to anyone outside of the group, but I did read the Bible, and I actually think that's what helps make me a, a writer. It was the pure in old English language. I don't know if it's old English, but that King, the King James version of the Bible is beautiful um, English. Um, so they were Bible-based. Um, Father David just had a very kind of distorted interpretation of the Bible. So we would read the the pure King James version, but he would take verses and interpret them and you know he believed he was God's prophet and you know we were all following him and um, yeah, he would just adopt the adopt the verse to his you know modern um, perspective and there's also non-religious uh, again schools of thought so a sect is more of a school of thought and like I said I just learned this uh, in in December is that the children of God does does um, categorize as a sect which is quite interesting I think This is another interesting thing. <laughs> um, how cults manipulate and control. So again, this might be something that some, you, you might relate to on some level. Um, so the acronym is BITE, B-I-T-E. They control through behavior, information, thought, and emotions. Um, so with behavior, they control food, lifestyle, um, living arrangements, finances. Um, so growing up, we lived in compounds. Um, we were told where to live, when to move. Um, everything was very strictly monitored. There was no stream of income. My parents, um, no one had jobs. No one was allowed jobs. Everyone had to cut um, all ties with their family. So Father David believed that the family unit was an impediment to God's work. Um, so when people joined the group, they would, he would cut them, um, he would make them basically sever all ties with their family. So all of our like day-to-day -day living was very controlled. Um, information, this is actually one of, I think one of the most important, so when I, w I was in, um, in journalism school, they talked about how whenever there's a coup, the first thing that the, um, the people who are taking over like a country is they cut off information because that's the first way to control people. If people have access to the news or 
in just information, they're going to be able to rebel accordingly. So um, they cut off all forms of media for us. Like I never even watched TV for good or ill. I don't know. I mean, <laughs> I have my own thoughts on that. But you know, we weren't allowed to read books. I really had no um, no idea of history. Um, except for what Father David wanted to, to teach us. Um, thought. So that's actually, thought is where, where the brainwashing comes in. So they use um, words, language, propaganda. There's a lot of imagery, which I really hope we can get this media clip to work because you could see some of that. Um, but they use imagery. So Father David used a lot of um, colorful posters and cartoons for the children. Um, again, words and language, we kind of had our own lingo. Um, some of it I, I touch upon in the book. Um, but again, it's all, always to create that us versus them doctrine. And then finally, they control through fear, or sorry, through emotions. Um, just I, I just picked three, but there's a lot of other emotions. But fear was a big one. So growing up, I was, I was quite terrified. Um, we kind of lived our lives frozen in fear, at least as a child I did. And we were very terrified of the world outside. So um, not just within the group, but if we dared to leave the group and step outside of the walls, um, the world outside was doomed, everyone outside was evil or lost, and it was our job to either save them or avoid them. So there was a lot of fear, there was a lot of guilt um, about leaving, so sometimes members would leave, and you know there would just be guilt. You know, if we if we thought of leaving, there would be a lot of guilt, and then and a very um, distinguishing emotion the children of God used was love. So Father David adopted this system, this belief system of love, and everything he did, he would say it was in the name of love. Everything, discipline, abuse, sex, um, his own evangelical teachings. So as a child, that was very confusing, you know, because we thrive on love. Um, so I actually think that was even more dangerous than the other ones, because you use love to manipulate someone, and you're going to have them in the palm of your hand because they think they're getting love. Um, so when Dr. Oz did my interview, they did a wonderful, do I hear something? No? No sound? Um, they did wonderful reportage on it, if you um, have a chance to look it up. And um, one thing the woman took away from it is that they used isolation and trauma to control us. And I, again, I, I continue to find out things about you know, my childhood and how I grew up um, as I you know, go through. I've been out of it for, gosh, over 20 years, but I still continue to learn things. I mean, this cult, I know... It started in 1968, but I was when I did the my talk at the Religious Studies Department. It's it's going to go down in history as one of the most notorious, infamous cults be, because of their ex, uh, the extremism of it, um, and that's why it's always making the news. I mean, it's been a year now, and I still get you know media inquiries. Um, so isolation and trauma were two two ways that they controlled us. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about Father David. I don't have a picture. You know, when I was getting these slides together, I think that's all I have. When I get these slides together, it's weird because I, I want people to have that visual again, but I couldn't even bring myself to put a picture of him up there. It's just, it's almost like icky. I don't know. <laughs> um, but Father David was a very um, interesting character. Um, I always make sure to tell people, and some people don't know this, I never saw him. I never knew what he looked like. My parents never met him. Um, yeah, most of his follow. yeah, he's sort of like an Oz-like figure, which again was very unique about this cult. So it wasn't like we had this leader who was sitting around and everyone was like bowing down to him. No, he, because of some of his very radical beliefs, was in hiding, on the run from the law. Um, and we would, his, his, his um, propaganda would trickle in um, through, he, we had a whole production um, team. Um, so the cover of my book, some of you have seen it, that is actually the caricature of Father David. So he would, in, his, in pictures that he would send out to us, he would white out his face and draw in the face of a lion. So everyone always asks what that is or who that is. That's... It's a cartoon caricature of Father David. 
Um, again, narcissistic textbook narcissist. Um, again, this is all stuff that I sort of had to learn uh, about and study. I, I never met this person. I didn't know who he was, and he controlled my entire existence. Um, so cult leaders, and again, if you've had like an experience with an, a, like an abusive relationship, you'll see there's, there's similarities. Um, they're, they're very obscure. They, they're they're godlike, so they like to set themselves up on a pedestal and, again, separate themselves, you know, um, from, from their subjects, from their victims, right? And then they would um, turn a mirror. So the narcissist doesn't want to look at him or herself, so they flip the mirror on others and tell. So there was always this, like, self-inquiry going on. We always had to to be thinking about what we were doing wrong, you know. So there's a, a lot of guilt as a child. Um, they're very manipulative, um, and they're plagued by demons. Um, I always question if Father Na David knew what he was doing. I, I, I don't know if I'll ever know that. Um, I don't know. I don't know. It comes down to that question of evil. What is evil? When a person is evil, do they know what they're doing? Or they, do they just slowly sort of dissolve into this person? and they're just wreaking havoc. I mean, so many young people, especially in my generation, lost their lives. You know, they left the cult and they, they committed suicide. And um, yeah, he caused a lot of pain, a lot of suffering, you know, and then he passed away and we were just left to, to basically fend for ourselves. Um, so a little history about the children of God. It started right in this backyard. <laughs> Um, in 1968, in Huntington Beach, I visited the Ground Zero, and it's actually a surf shop now. Um, <laughs> so he came out to California. He was born in Oklahoma. He came from a long line of evangelists. So um, I did a lot of research. I always say I know more about this man than most of his followers do. When I was writing the book, I did it. It was really hard. I didn't like doing it, but I, I had to research this person. Um, so he came from a long line of evangelists. So he had a very strong evan evangelist, evangelistic, evangelist, evangelical. There you go. Thank you, <laughs> evangelical uh, background. Um, he also had a, a long history of ostracism. I think that's a word. Ostracization. <laughs> People were ostracized. Ostracized. <laughs> Thank you. You think I'd be better with words? Um, so. Dating back like a hundred years, his ancestors, you know, were ostracized from the church for converting to Orthodox from Ju Judaism, and there was a lot of uh, controversy. Basically, kind of, I guess, ran in his blood. But his family, he, his mother was a, quite a famous preacher, and his father was a singer. They were both preachers, but his mother was more like the star of the show. And um, he adored his mother. He wanted to follow in her footsteps. And um, he had a, a, a conflict between his desire to serve God and his own sexual desire. And that's kind of how it started. It started at a very young age. Um, when he was a young man, he was ostracized for trying to introduce some radical belief. I think he wanted to bring some of the, the native um, Indians into the church, and the church didn't want it, right? They wanted to segregate, and like, no, they can't come in. And he, want, he believed you know, that everyone should be able to, to hear God's message, and so he was ostracized for that. So he kind of felt like an outcast, and he wanted to create his own new, new church, basically. And that's what the Children of God was. He thought he was revolutionizing the, 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 the church, basically. Um, so he came out to California. His mother was getting old. He was getting close to 50. And he saw the young people the hippies um, on the pier, um, in the coffee shops, and he sort of had this, this, this epiphany, this revelation from God. You know how the, the leader always has that epiphany moment? He had that. Um, and he had this vision that he was supposed to help these hippies. These hippies were lost, and it was his job to help them. So he started to gather them. And again, it started out very innocent. I think he, he sort of had good intentions. I think he was fighting his own inner demons, but he had good intentions. And, Definitely the people who started joining had good intentions, too. You know, they got off drugs, so no more drugs. Um, they started to study the Bible. Um, they used a lot of music. So they, he kind of gave them an alt alternative lifestyle to what they were living. And this was, again, back in 1960s, 1970s. Um, 
maybe like in the late, 19, late 70s, early 80s, um, his, as his mission began to grow, his belief system started to grow. And this is where he started to fester these ideas that, that kind of became more twisted. So in the beginning, it was very pure. In fact, they didn't even allow sex in the beginning. It was like, you know, you were celibate, you were devoting your life to God. They, down in, in, a, in Skid Row, it's actually still there. Um, Fred, Fred Jordan, he was a pretty famous TV evangelist. He was Father David's mentor. And, you know, they had homeless missions. Um, so they were doing really good things. As a child, I remember seeing a lot of this, this sort of charity work. And um, the group started to grow, and I think he didn't know what to do with all these people following him, you know. So he had to really develop this, like, unique belief system. Um, so he started to, you know, interpret the Bible. He started to claim to speak to God. Um, he started adopting some interesting sexual practices. He actually sent the woman out to prostitute themselves. And that's when he had to kind of go in hiding because, you know, people were after him. He would send the, the, his followers to churches and they would have what was called woe the church ministry and they would um, sort of invade the church and um, try to spread their message um, dressed in sackcloth with staves and, you know, big scrolls. Um, around this time, he had a revelation that the world was going to end. The West was evil and it was our job to save the world. So when I was around five, um, I remember, I don't remember the exact moment, I think I, I write about it in the book, but um, we had to all leave. So I, I was born in Sweden. My parents met in 1978. I was born in Sweden, and then we moved to Mexico. Like Natalie said, we were always on the move. Um, it's one characteristic was you kind of had to keep ourselves from getting caught, basically. So we were constantly moving. Um, so we moved to Mexico when I was turned one, and then California. So my dad's from South Pasadena. And we lived here for a few years. And um, when I was around four, Father David had this revelation to, to flee the Western world. He, be he really believed there was a lot of evil in the West. He was very anti-capitalism, anti-consumerism. Um, he had a really strong political beliefs. And then he mixed that with his biblical beliefs. And he had his, you know, his, his followers just you know, eating it all up. Um, so my family moved to Thailand, and that's where I spent the majority of my childhood, um, which I talk about in my book. And um, I don't want to give too much away of how I left um, the cult. Um, let's see. I do want to do a reading. Um, so I think I'll, I'll do that now. And then after that, we'll open it up to some questions. So I'm sure you have a lot of questions. Um, we can, yeah. You know them from Hollywood, actress Rose McGowan and actors River and Joaquin Phoenix. But did you know they all grew up in the same cult? A cult that secluded them from the outside world, exposed them to sex at an early age, and preached the end of times. Author Floor Edwards also grew up in that cult, led by its notorious leader, David Brant Berg. Today, in an exclusive Daily Mail interview, Floor steps forward to reveal the life she lived as one of the children of God. Nobody joins a cult. People join a movement, a belief system, but nobody says, hey, I'm gonna join a cult today. People get sucked into it. Flora Edwards was born into the children of God after her parents, looking for purpose in their lives, joined the sect. Founded in 1968 in California by David Brant Berg, who followers called Father David. The children of God believed the apocalypse was at hand. Father David pushed sexual freedom and he even advocated underage sex and sex between adults and children, all of which have been the subject of numerous documentaries over the years. This is what I preach, and I preach sex, boys and girls, hallelujah. It actually had very innocent beginnings. And Father David, he wanted to change sort of the paradigm of what the traditional church was, the way that they, they viewed the body or the way that they, they viewed sex, he thought was wrong. God created boys and girls able to have children by about the age of 12. My God, now he's gonna advocate childhood sex. 
Good. For a time, Father David also advocated what he called flirty fishing, using women members to recruit for the sect. They used their bodies. They would, you know, recruit men and have sex with them and sometimes get donations from them. Floor writes in her newly published memoir that she was spared the sexual abuses of the cult, but Father David's preaching about the apocalypse weighed heavy on her. According to the cult leader, the world would end in 1993, when Floor would be a mere 12 years old. I definitely lived my childhood quite terrified of, of death and of the end time. Father David also believed Western civilization was evil, so he sent many of his followers to the Far East, Floor's family included. In Thailand, the children of God grew up in seclusion, cut off from the wider world. We always had to have houses with high walls, and I wasn't allowed to read, write, watch movies, or talk to anyone outside of the group. When the world didn't end, as Father David predicted, he allowed his followers to move back to the States, but then he died a year later. after Father David died, the cult sort of started to disintegrate. Settling in California, Floor says life with newfound freedoms was tough. She began experimenting with alcohol and marijuana. I was just trying to numb any type of, of, of pain. Things were very rough and I did try to take my life. Floor survived an attempted alcohol and painkiller overdose, but some of the children of God weren't as lucky. Ricky Rodriguez was Father David's adopted son. He claimed horrific abuse and documented his downward spiral on home video. There's this need that I have, this need, it's not a want, it's a need, and I wish it wasn't, but it is. It's a need for revenge. In 2005, when he was 29, Ricky Rodriguez stabbed his former nanny to death, then shot and killed himself. When he died, it sent shockwaves through the second generation members. Though Floor never met them, other second generation members who were also able to escape the cult included Rose McGowan and River and Joaquin Phoenix. So what does Floor believe is the biggest lesson learned? You must save yourself or you will remain unsaved. A lot of religions, that's part of the downfall is that they kind of look to something else to save them. And I think in the end, we all have to save ourselves. Floor Edwards' memoir, Apocalypse Child, Life and End Times is out now and is soon to be released as an audiobook. <laughs> when you see it like that. Um, so you can see, I was that like shocking? A little bit, yeah. They always make it, whenever I watch it, I'm always like, yeah, it's true, but it's not really, that wasn't like how I grew up. They always, they like to edit it, you know, take all the, the you know, the sensational stuff. Um, so let's, let's go to something a little more edifying. <laughs> My book. Um, so I'll talk real quickly about when I started writing my book. It was the year Ricky Rodriguez died, which you saw up there. Did any of you hear about that? It was 2005, so about 13 years ago. Um, but yeah, it sent shockwaves. He was like our role model, model growing up. We were supposed to be like him. And I remember coming home one day, and my mom was like, have you seen the news? And I was like, no. And she said, uh, Davidito is what we called him. He killed himself, and he had murdered a woman, so he committed a murder-suicide. And I was turned on the news that night and all the news stations were running stories on it and it was the first time I saw it told by the media and then that I've been thinking about writing a book for a while but I remember that year I just I was like I have to do this I have to tell my story the way that I want to tell it um, so that was around yeah 13 years ago and it took me about 12 years to write it um, so I'm going to read a little section of a chapter, not the whole chapter. Um, and I talked a little bit about how he severed family ties. So growing up, I never knew any of my grandparents. Um, we didn't even really have contact with like old people. And I thought about that recently because my grandmother just passed away. And I didn't know her. I met her like twice, but I, didn't, I never had a, a grandparent. And then I, I thought about it, and I was like, oh, I didn't just not know I was going to be adults, but I never really had like contact because all the adults were pretty young. So they were like in their 20s and 30s. And that was all we knew. So it was kind of like this idea of old age and, you know, death by old age was just completely non-existent. Um, so the passage I'm going to read is the story of when my, my, my grandfather passed away. Um, and again, I, I never met him. 
Um, he was Danish. Um, he lived in Sweden. And um, Father David, we didn't just cut ties with our family. We also had to like burn any photos, you know. So this is where the, sh the story starts. So <clears throat> earlier that year, Father David had ordered us to burn any photos depicting an outside relative. Mom kept one photograph of her parents, justifying it since their faces were not clearly visible. The photograph was yellow stained and torn near the edges. In the photo, the grandfather I'd never met is lying on a reclining poolside lawn chair, lifting his, arm, his left arm to cover his face. His skin is deeply bronzed in the midday sun. He's leaning toward my mormor, the Swedish name for grandmother. They're both sunbathing near what looks to be a backyard pool. It's probably sometime in the late afternoon during, during high summer in Scandinavia, the land of the midnight sun. Mormor is young and darkly tan and is wearing a blue one-piece bathing suit. Her skin is olive and her hair is brown and thick like mom's and she's covering part of her face and laughing, probably at something my grandfather just said. That was the only image I had of my mom's parents. I didn't know much more about my grandfather. I knew from the photograph that he liked to sunbathe until his skin turned the color of copper. I knew that, like my Uncle Bob on my dad's side, he had a bit of a drinking problem. He used to wake mom and her younger sister Ava in the middle of the night in his drunken rages, yelling for no reason at all. I knew that Denmark was a ferry ride away from the southernmost tip of Sweden, and whenever mom wanted to get away, she paid the ferry conductor a shiny coin. Most kids born into the children of God never knew, knew of, or met their grandparents. My grandma, Marianne, dad's mom, died the year I was born, so I never met her. And I had been too young to remember mom's mom, Mormor, who took Tamar and me to a real church ceremony in Sweden to get baptized when we were newborns. We wore long, white, flowing dresses. After our family left Sweden for Mexico City, mom hardly spoke to her family. One morning, she told me she had received a letter from her mother informing her that her father had died. He died from cancer, she said. She shook her head and looked down. Tears welled up in her eyes. I could tell she missed him. I knew there was no time for me to cry in the family, especially over someone I'd never known. After a hearty breakfast of rice cereal with powdered milk and cane sugar, we marched in line to our designated groups. The adults were assigned to their duties and some children were hustled away for special disciplinary action. I shivered whenever I heard my peers being beaten. During recess, I paced along the balcony overlooking the sprawling yard. To my right, a white drained bathtub where babies sometimes played sat under the shade of a ripe mango tree. The sun beat down ricocheting off the fat blades of grass that snaked through the lawn. Plump fluorescent green flies with purple iridescent wings buzzed outside the screen doors. A young boy, Timmy, was being beaten again, and with each lash of the belt, he let out a cry that sounded like a war hoop. I felt my insides tighten up. There was nothing I could do but be as quiet and still as possible so I wouldn't have to endure the same punishment. <clears throat> Beads of sweat formed on my forehead and pasted my bangs to the side of my head. My heart was racing. I peered into the distance and saw mom's figure. She had been given the day off to grieve and was sitting outside on a lawn chair, alone. It was high noon. Mom sat with her legs crossed. 
Her olive skin reflected the sharp rays of the sun. She sat isolated, in quarantine, no one to talk to, and no one to share her grief. There was a part of me that wanted to grieve when I realized she was also someone's daughter. Tamar, Tamar's my twin sister, she's in here a lot, she's my identical twin sister. Tamar appeared behind me. What's mom doing out there all by herself, she said. She's crying. Why, Tamar said. Cause her daddy just died, I said. She told me this morning. I'd cry if my daddy died, she said. He's my daddy too, not just yours. I'd cry too if he died, I said. We kids often playfully argued over ownership of our parents. How dare you say my dad? I paused for a moment to think. At least we all get to go to heaven together when the end time comes. That way, we don't have to lose mommy or daddy first. Yeah, Tamar said. Her face was pressed against the thin screen that covered the window, and she ran her fingers along its jagged edges. Do you think she's going to fly back to Sweden for his funeral? I asked. This is one of my favorite passages. <laughs> I imagined what a funeral in Sweden might look like. A gathering of bereaved people huddled together on a soft blanket of snow, dressed in their best church clothes, black tuxedos, ruffled taffeta dresses, and low hats to conceal their mourning faces. They grieved over the one thing they had in common, a cold body slowly being lowered into the ground with an extensive system of rope and chain pulleys. The minister would say, from dust thou art to dust thou shalt return, and mourners would pour handfuls of dirt over the shiny brass coffin. Probably not, Tamar said. I don't think we have the money for a plane ticket to Sweden. Plus, Mom hasn't spoken to her dad in years, I said. I just thought of something, Tamar said. She took a deep breath. What if Father David dies? What will happen then? He must be as old as our grandpa. Father David's not going to die, I said. We're all going to heaven first. I looked over the balcony to the distance at Mom again. She was rocking her body back and forth, stopping to wipe tears from her face as she cried. On a table next to her lay some family literature, daily mites, daily breads, and mo letters. Those kinds of things comforted her. Do you think mommy missed her daddy before he died? Tamar said. I don't know, I said. I shrugged. Maybe when you become an adult, you stop missing your parents altogether. I wondered if that was why they joined the children of God in the first place, to find a new family. I'll never stop missing mommy and daddy, I said, even if I get older. Me neither, Tamar said, even if we become adults. Okay, so now we have time for questions. <laughs> One, shut up, two, three. I think we're passing a mic around, so. Thank you. After the apocalypse came and went, uh -huh. what was the reaction of the group to Father David? I mean, you know, what he had preached, the yeah. reason why everyone was there was to be saved right. and what have you, but that wasn't necessary. Yeah, um, so I always tell, well, the apocalypse didn't come? Just um, uh, I always tell people it was anticlimactic. So if you're familiar with the Bible, the book of Revelation has like a plan. It's a seven-year plan. And there's going to be a one-world leader. And then there's going to be a contract. And it's going to be broken. And there's going to be the great tribulation. So we were always looking for this like seven-year period uh, preceding 
the end of the world. So when he set the date at 93, but we were still, we were waiting for the Antichrist basically. So he was always predicting like who the Antichrist was. Um, and then once we started to get closer to the 90s, I think he was starting to realize that he had gathered all these people and he was kind of like taking them to the edge of the cliff, like as a metaphor, right? And he was getting sick. So he sort of created a distraction and he, that's when he sent us all back to the West. I didn't talk much about that, but my family, we all moved back to the States and to Europe. And then at that point we had a whole new life to kind of adjust to. So we were no longer thinking about um, that. But then when 93 came, um, they started to just tell us it was going to happen any year. So every year they would say, it could happen this year, it could happen this year. And then Father David died, and that was a whole, a whole other trauma. So, but yeah, it's a good question. People always want to know. I wish I had a more exciting, I should just make up a story and be like, we went into the caves and, you know. How, did you, how were you supported? <laughs> Since you moved so much mm -hmm. around, yeah. where did your money come from? Yeah, we, would, we had a big outreach program. So we would get a lot of donations. They had a very strong PR group. So even amidst everything you see, the family, the, they were called the Children of God, and they became the family. So I refer in the book, I refer to them as the Children of God. But, um, but yeah, they would basically gather, um, like get donations. You know, people would, they would show the, like the, the, um, the show part, right? The part of us doing charity work, of singing, of, you know, um, helping homeless people. And then people would help us, you know, because they're like, oh, these, look at these good, wonderful foreigners in, in Thailand doing all this good work. And we, we did do good work, too. You know, it wasn't all just bad. Um, so that was one way we produced tapes, posters, literature, um, and we would sell them. And then us as kids, we would have to go out sometimes and sort of, uh, what is it called? Proselytize. Yeah, yeah, big, basically. Um, so yeah, we somehow, we didn't have a lot of money because, you know, the world was ending. Um, so like food, we only ate food that was free, so it was often quite unappetizing. I, you'll, in the book, I talk a lot about that. But yeah, um, we basically, like, for example, houses, we would get very reduced rent, and we would live in these very beautiful homes. Um, but yeah, we, we called it living by faith. Father David taught us, like, we didn't have to worry where our next meal was coming from. God was going to provide. It was, again, very biblical. God was going to provide for us. We don't need to worry. And somehow we did, you know, I always say as tough as it was, I, I never starved. So we always had a meal. Um, but yeah, we, we kind of just gathered money as we went along. And we adjusted, you know. So sometimes we'd make money one way, and then all of a sudden we'd have to start making money a different way. Okay, you said that um, you were one of 11 siblings. 12, yeah. 12 mm -hmm. siblings. So how did you all fare after? After? Yes. Some are doing well and some are not doing so well, unfortunately. Yeah. So, um, yeah, there's 12 of us. I'm the fourth oldest of 12. And, um, you know, we all sort of had to make sense of it. I, I chose my way of, of making sense of it. I, I strongly believe in education. Um, I loved writing. I thought writing this book was extremely cathartic for me. Um, but, yeah, some of them um, didn't do so well. Yes. Um, so you mentioned you didn't you didn't meet Father David, mm -hmm. is that right? Mm -hmm. How was he able to teach and lead you guys when he when you were in different locations? Uh, through his literature and propaganda. So you may, you saw a few like pictures, and I was talking a little bit about it. But he produced thousands of letters, um, and it wasn't him writing; it was just him speaking. So he basically just like. I find out later, basically kind of just like sat in his bed, lived in his robe, and just talked. Kind of, <laughs> he thought he was speaking to God, you know, and he was having this like spiritual experience, and then everything he said was recorded, and then they would take that and print it, and that was basically all we read. And so he had like children's, the stuff for children would be a little more edited, so they would create stories for us. Um, but yeah, he would, he would communicate with his followers for sure. And so the, f the followers just kind of ate up everything he said. Um, and then I dealt with my theory that a big problem was that he didn't actually write. Because if he actually sat down and took the time to write it, he may have realized his fallacies <laughs> right away, right? Because if you just talk, this is, this is me going into my own writing philosophy, but if you just talk, you can say anything. But if you write, you have to actually think about it. <laughs> so that's just my own personal opinion. He was a madman. 
floor. I, yes. um, I'm over here. Ah, there you are. I read your book prior to coming this evening, and I know you, I enjoyed it, and I know you enjoy writing. Are you planning on writing additional novels? Or? I, I do want to write more, yes. I have not. This book just came out. It took me 12 years to get it to completion. Um, I'm in grad school right now. I'm studying English. I don't know what my next project is going to be, but I, I take it slow. I'm not like someone who's going to be pumping out books, you know, every year. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm thinking. It, take, it takes me a long time to think about what I want to do, and then and then I start start working on it. But yeah, I definitely want to. I, I, I it's not like I want to. I'm going to have to at some point. Great, thank you. Yeah. Question about. I think so. I think so. I have a question about your relationship with your parents. Mm -hmm. Do you blame them in any way for? Do I recognize you, Colette? No. No. Sorry. <laughs> no, the one next to you. No. 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 Okay. Sorry. Sorry. In our past lives. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but um, are, do you have any anger towards them? What is your relationship with your parents? Do you blame them for having you live this life? Did, what happened to them? after the cult dissolved? Um, so at first I had to understand what happened, because this was a very complicated story, and especially like as a teenager, and even as an adult, I still have moments where I'm like, oh my god, what happened? This is insane. It's like, again, like a big social experiment. But I had to understand, again, the me mechanisms of cults and manipulation, and I, ha I understood that they were victims too. Um, they may have made a mistake by joining. They weren't mean parents, they weren't awful parents, but they did make a mistake by having all us kids and not preparing us for the world at all. I mean, a lot of kids suffered a lot more than I did. Um, so I understood that, and that was, it almost made it more hard because, you know, you read, I don't know if a lot of you read memoirs or you hear stories about tough childhoods, and the parents are always the monsters. But my parents weren't monsters. In fact, they're very nice people. Um, I think I go through phases in my life where I, I'll have anger, I'll kind of be like, God, I was really put at a disadvantage. It's like I wasn't not given a golden spoon in my, or silver spoon or whatever they say. I was like put way behind the start line, right? And I have to do a lot of makeup work, but that's just my life and I've learned to cope with it. And, um, but yeah, I have moments of anger. Um, but it's more, it's more questions. It's more kind of like, how, how, how could this happen? But I, again, through writing this book, I always just try to flip it and turn it into, I, I don't see the point in sitting around and blaming. And I learned right away, if I did that, if I blamed my life on my past, I would have every reason to not live, basically. Like, I'd have so many reasons to blame, right? Because it's just, it's an impossible childhood to even comprehend or imagine. So I, just, I had to make that decision. I'm not going to blame anything on anyone, you know? Um, a lot of kids did, um, and it doesn't mean I don't see it clearly. I think I, I see what happened, um, but um, but yeah, I couldn't blame blame anyone. I guess I had to see it again when I wrote. For you have read it. I, I get a lot of compliments about my sort of objective, kind of matter of fact. I, I do have a little bit of a background in journalism, but it's very like just report what happened without judgment, good, bad. That's how I had to see it to even make sense of it. Um, yeah. What to you? How did they... My dad is now a professor. My mother actually developed a pretty advanced stage of cancer, but then she healed from it. And now her health's a little in decline. Um, but my dad went on to pursue education. So, yeah. I have a two-pronged question. Okay. Do experts now believe that Father David was delusional? Do who? Believe? Delusional. But does experts. Who... I don't actually know that. There's been a ton of writing on the children of God. There's been dissertations. There's been books. Um, the professor I heard talk about it. I don't know how much psych psychoanalysis has been done on him. Um, they'd have to read his his teachings, I think, and I'm I'm sure they'd see. They definitely. I, I that's an interesting question. I actually have never thought. Oh, was he delusional? Just he like would see things he would like have visions you know mm -hmm. but i never thought that he was delusional i thought like he was uh, i don't know creative i don't know it's a good question have cult members benefited from deprogramming cult deprogramming i don't know you know people ask me that um i haven't done any of that i, I don't know i've heard of that kind of like they what they do with the scientology that's right yeah the the you know the psychological brainwashing was was deep and i realize this more and more you know especially when i'm in school and i'm like 
understanding how the mind works. And I realized that we were basically psychologically completely, and as children, like with a developing brain, um, so this is something I do. I always say, and I know I don't look like it, but it's almost like I have a bit of an invisible disability um, because our brains were almost completely um, manipulated. manipulated. Yeah, like abused, like basically almost taken. And you can't see that. There's no scars. There's no, you know, there's no physical evidence of that. Um, so I don't even know that deprogramming would almost feel like brainwashing. I don't know. I, I haven't actually thought of that. It's <laughs> a good question. I wanted to ask, um, did having a twin have any particular, uh, did, did having a twin have any particular yes. extra relevance? It's the reason why I think I'm alive. <laughs> okay. Yeah. We would talk things, you, and if you read the book, we, um, we kind of had our own little dialogue with each other where we would question things, and we would always get punished for being foolish. We always wanted to laugh, I think. The question that hasn't come up yet, but people always want to know, is like, did you know something was wrong? Yeah, of course I knew something was up. I just didn't know how to like articulate it. But but yeah, we'd always be like laughing, and um, and then when we got out, we'd always we would talk. You know, we would talk a lot about it, and that's kind of how the idea of a book came about because we would tell our story, um, and then eventually I was like, I have to write this. But definitely yes. There's some. So what happened when you arrived home back on this planet mm -hmm. with 12 children? Where did you go? Oh, gosh. How did you afford to live? Where did you live? What did your parents do All to make a living? Was, see how I teased you? Um, yeah, we were kind of abandoned. So the leader died, and they came out with a bunch of rules, and we just kind of had to fend for ourselves. It was a really dark time, um, and we were in Chicago. And uh, I don't want to give too much away because this is all in the book. But, um, but yeah, my dad had to, like, um, find a way to make money. We had no job, no education, no experience, no contacts. Um, so, yeah, we were abandoned. Just Basically, yeah, just dropped. And I remember it was so uh, extreme. Like, even though I, wasn't, I didn't even know it was happening, I knew something was happening. I could tell that I, I felt like I had been dropped on a different planet. Um, I actually found out I grew up in a cult through a quiz in a Seventeen magazine. <laughs> it's always, yeah, some people don't believe me, but I, it's in the book too, and I um, picked up a magazine, there was a quiz, it said, did you grow up in a cult, take this quiz and find out now. It was like, I swear, if a god does exist, that was god right there. <laughs> um, and yeah, and at that point my eyes were, I was like 15, and my, it was not far from here actually. My eyes were open, and I, I knew what had happened. And from there, I had to like unravel it, and you know, um, continue to heal. And do you have a belief in God now? Um, that's a that's an interesting question. I, I'm very, I'm very open to to all religions, and I like I, I don't have an aversion to it like I used to. Basically, I believe in something. I don't know that I believe in in God as like a an entity as as much as you know a higher power. But, um, but yeah, I don't, I don't have like a strict set of beliefs. I more like to discuss them with people, yeah. Yes. Uh, you said you, that basically you weren't taught to read or write. Or, mm -hmm. So uh, tell us about your education. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I went to high school and um, I did very well academically and very poor socially. Um, I got involved with the wrong crowds. I started drinking, doing drugs. and But somehow my, I kept my grades up. My sister and I both, I got kicked out of high school. I never graduated high school. That's when I attempted suicide. And um, my dad took, there's me, my sister, and another sister, and he put us in college. And that was a huge turning point for me. Um, and that's actually how my book ends, is um, I wrote a research paper, and that's when the idea of this book came. And I think in college, it, we, met, we started to meet people that were more open-minded. So in high school, I had to like hide my past. I wouldn't talk about it. And when I went to college, people were much more you know, um, open to, to hear. They thought it was interesting. Um, so I went to college for um, community college. And then um, I actually got into Berkeley. 
even though I, I actually didn't know what Berkeley was. When the professor talked about it, I, I raised my hand. I said, what's, Ber what's UC Berkeley? Kid you not. I thought it was in Bakersfield. I had no idea. And then I got in, like, the same year. Um, I didn't go. I actually ended up getting my undergraduate at Cal State Fullerton, and then I got a master's in creative writing, and now I'm back at Cal State Long Beach uh, working on an English degree. I'm considering doing a PhD, but I'm taking that slow. But yeah, I love education. I think it's very important. So when basically the, the cult falls apart, mm -hmm. at that point in your life, could you read and write? Yeah, yeah, we read and write, wrote, um, maybe didn't, yeah, the Bible. Yeah, the Bible and Father David's teachings. I don't know how much that's influenced me as a writer. Um, I know the Bible did. And I remember when I started writing the book and I started to get like compliments from like professionals, they would almost be like, oh, you have a real gift for writing. And I was like, I would tell them my story a little bit. And, and I, I, just, I just kind of came to the conclusion that um, a big part of it was the Bible actually. It's a well-written book. But no, I could read and write. I just wasn't really allowed to. I, got, I didn't grow up on fairy tales. So I don't know like any of those like fairy tales or those like some of those Bible stories. Or no, sorry, the I know all the Bible stories. <laughs> I think there's there's some over here. Where? Yes. You can start talking. I'll just look. All right. Um, two questions. Uh -huh. What uh, where your twin is now, mm -hmm. and then at any given time, how many people really were a part of this cult? Mm. My twin lives in the North Bay, so she's up in Marin County. We see each other from time to time. Um, we're really still close, but we just don't. We just kind of had chose different paths. I went through education. She's in a more like she does like massage therapy and you know more alternative lifestyle. Um, the group, I believe, the I heard numbers between 12 to 20,000. I think it was closer to the 12,000 range, but that was the maximum number. Um, they were very active, and they were actually on a list of like one of the most dangerous cults because of their activity. So even though we weren't we weren't super small, but we weren't that big either. For for a cult, we were big, but for a church, we were small. But our activity was very widespread. So they were able to reach a huge amount of people because of their fanaticism, basically. So in the video, um, you, you gave the advice of we, as people, or like as a society, look to others to save us. Mm -hmm. but your advice is to save ourselves. Mm -hmm. Can you expand on that? Yeah. Actually, that's a quote from Alice Siebold. She's like a native of Irvine, right? Yeah, she got her MFA at UC Irvine. So it's funny, whenever I say that, it is a good, very good, profound quote, but it's not even mine. <laughs> but, um, you know, gosh, sometimes I say things later on, I'm like, why did I say that? What do I mean by that? I think I mean by that is... Um, is to do the inner work. You know, for a long time I kind of started to study, a big part of my healing was studying Eastern religions and um, kind of, uh, yeah, learning more about self-healing and self-work, so not always relying on this, this power that's outside of, like, I think the question about God, I, my answer would be, if there is a God, it's, it's not something that's out there, it's something that's inside. You know, who, who says that, um, you must see God in all, or you cannot see God at all. Is that how it goes? Have you heard that one? Um, anyways, so um, I, I guess it's this idea of, of no, non-separation, right? So if, and separation is a, is a, a big problem, right? So, um, so yeah, not like thinking that something out there is going to save us. Something inside is going to save us, right? What was yeah. your family's reaction to Jim Jones and um, Kool-Aid? Um, where is that? Oh, there you are. <laughs> you know, it's funny. We, when the Jim Jones thing happened, we had just moved to the States, and Father David would always root for the underdog. Um, he was always finding stories to promote his teachings. And, um, oh, no, I don't, you know, we never heard about that. We heard about the Koresh thing, the Koresh. So the Koresh thing in Texas, um, 
he was like, oh, look what happened. He was doing God's work and, you know, the people came and killed him and he was like a martyr and all that. But we, I don't think we heard about Jim Jones, so I don't know. What movement or sect um, in contemporary society concerns you? Oh, that's a good question. Wow. I might have to think about that one for a little bit. Um, gosh, what comes to mind initially is these, like, I really have a hard time with, like, people who promote spirituality in a way that's, um, how can I say this? Like, everything's justified because of spirituality, right? Everything's... Um, it's kind of similar to the, like the hippie movement, um, but they kind of think that, um, anything done in the name of spirituality is, is good. And that to me is very dangerous. If you start justifying things, there's no end to how far it can go. And that's what Father David did with love. He's like, oh, anything done in the name of love is good. So he did everything in the name of love, you know? Um, but I, I, you, you, it sounds like you want to know more about like actual groups or sects, like um, religious. I was just thinking you must be scanning the newspapers mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. you know, television news and mm -hmm. you have your antenna out mm -hmm. for For like things. extreme religious groups? Yeah, when it comes to, I mean, when the whole um, ISIS thing was really hot on the news, it was really alarming. Um, because you could see that extremism, and I think I would have a deeper reaction than most people. Most people would look at it, and I'd be like, oh my god, I kind of knew what was happening in some weird way. Um, but my question is always, I guess a lot of times people want to say, oh, that person's bad. But for me, that's not the answer. I want to know what motivated them to get to that place, right? Um, so again, this story raises all kinds of questions of evil, right? And how, why people make decisions that they make and how they, they get to that point. Um, and I don't think, I don't know how to say this. Um, I think there's a deeper reason for it. You know, I don't think you can just, saying someone's just evil is you're putting a blanket over it. I, I think there are evil people in the world. Um, but I think like a lot of the people who do those horrible things, those shootings and, you know, just awful things in the name of God and extremism, extreme religion, um, I think they have a much deeper yearning for something. I mean, what pushed them to that point? And so that's, it's not like I, I think I have the answers at all. It's just I think I'm asking different questions, if that makes sense. And that's influenced by my childhood, you know. So when I do see the news, I feel like um, it's not so much I have opinions on it as more as I have questions about it that might be a little different than what most people are seeing or asking. And I think that's really important is to be asking questions as opposed to just forming opinions. All right, we have time for one more question. <clears throat> Hooray! Jana. Hooray! <laughs> All right. Um, did you find, did the boys of your group have a harder time than the girls? Which, which, you oh, mean well, the whole like group? when you were in Thailand, for mm -hmm. example, and you were talking about the boys being punished mm -hmm. and whatever, and, um. and I don't know, I, I'm, I'd be curious as to what they were being punished for, but I wondered if the, if you were all kind of girls and boys were treated equally or if there were different differences based on the sex? I don't know. That's a good question. Um, I think as they got older, boys, I don't know, actually. I've never been asked that. I think it was fairly equal. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, and they were also, at some point, they'd be sexualized. Like when we hit, I never, I've never was sexually abused, but... It was like we were looking forward to it. Like if the world the, the world didn't end, what I had to look forward to was becoming basically a, a sex, kind of a sex slave in a way. Um, so yeah, that was um, that was sort of, I guess, the abuse that they, but yeah, I think sometimes because the boys were like, you know, just physically stronger, they would maybe give them more punishment. But I, I don't know, I never really thought about that or asked that, but it's a good question. Well, thank you very much for coming, and thank you to Floor for a fantastic presentation. And we do have books for sale if anyone is interested. They're $17. Thank you.